SMT Nation, we back. Two stories from AT&T today, also one from SpaceX and Starlink. I'll go ahead and link all three in the description box for you to read if you like. Uh, we'll go through all of them. I'm going to go ahead and do some chapter markers for you guys here down on the screen. And you can jump between the stories or go back to certain parts of stories and look at those details. All right, first one. AT&T distributes its 5G SA core software across the U.S. All right, so when I first saw this title, I was intrigued by this because we're all patiently or impatiently waiting for standalone 5G networking because we know that's going to be the true real 5G, the next level of what this next generation of tech is supposed to be. Okay, so uh, AT&T hosted a trade journalist last week at its headquarters downtown Dallas. Uh, to meet with some of the company's top executives. The third floor is a conference so big that each chair had a microphone. (laughs) Okay. Anyways, let's see the highlights of this meeting. The 5G SA core is being distributed nationwide. According to Jeremy Legg, the chief technology officer at AT AT&T, he said historically the wired networks of copper and fiber operated separately from the wireless network, but AT&T is converging wired and wireless in municipalities across the country. In the process of deploying 5G SA core, AT&T is going to distribute the core software at sites around the country. Quote, we want to federate those core, those cores sit. Cores have historically only been in very few locations. We're trying to put them in a lot more locations. So what that's going to do, folks, it allows them to kind of create a more dynamic network, uh, gets you connectivity within multiple metros in which you can kind of then distribute your 5G network. This is probably going to be meaningful on a couple of different levels. I'd say with mobile network operations, obviously, but then also with MVNO. And then I think there's probably some enterprise things that they could do. This is probably really important to their plans in the future. All right, he says we could put a core in 1,000 edges, and I think this is wise because this is what their competition is doing, and I mean that specifically when describing Dish and also describing Verizon. I can't speak to T-Mobile only because I don't know uh, what their plans are for their edge compute, but I'm sure they're going to do it as well. A uh, select number of these central offices already running its 5G SA core software, so this tells us, folks, that we are very, very close. I would expect nothing later than Q1 of next year. AT&T Integrated Cloud saves tons of space. AT&T Labs, a forerunner in the software-defined network movement, built the AT&T Integrated Cloud. Okay, so I wonder if this is an element of what they have going on with Microsoft, with Azure. Uh, They, in speaking on this, uh, spoke to the old copper lines in the basement running out to the street through a manhole. Then we saw them migration of technology from copper to fiber from old-fashioned telco switches to proprietary black boxes from vendors which run switching function a lot of this explanation here uh, and this one actually is coming from chris sambar the vice president of the network said that the company spends well over a billion dollars per year on power okay so this kind of has to do with like uh wireline switching and switches and then also the 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 grid the power that it requires to run the wireless network and all the equipment that it requires. Uh, So yeah, and it it goes on to talk about the software from Azure, uh, Microsoft Azure. Okay, all right, so uh, cloud services, less sensitive storage, compute functions, okay. Uh, Here's the third element of this, AT&T keeping an eye on Verizon's concierge service. Okay, do you guys know, if you remember this story, Verizon is looking or was piloting a $35 assisted support charge when people buy a new phone from them or sign up for a new account, the concierge service, you would pay 30 or 35 bucks for assistance to set up devices, learn how to use them and stuff like that. So it used to be in retail, those things were included in the purchase of the device and the purchase of service. The retail agent would set you up, get all your stuff converted from your old device and things like that. And they're looking to charge specifically for this. Now, I'm all for this if the retail agent is collecting the dollars. But if it's just a Verizon fee, I'm not for this. All right. So AT&T is now piloting this thing called Right to You. Customers can have their new phone delivered 
work with a customer service rep to get the device set up. Only available in select zip codes. We're testing several models to see how as we go through it. All right, so I knew this was going to be an absolute can of worms. This was going to be Pandora's box. If Verizon was piloting it and finding success, AT&T was going to do it, and T-Mobile will too. Okay, next. Hurricane Ion proves the value of amphibious equipment. What is this? Okay, so uh, Agnew, which is Scott Agnew, vice president of AT&T's FirstNet. 150 individuals staged and ready to go in advance of the hurricane. FirstNet, obviously, got a bunch of emergency vehicles. You have cows. Uh, you have repair teams, right? They were on these in these locations during the uh, during the hurricane, ready to do repairs, ready to respond to sites going down and stuff like that. Okay, so speaking to that, uh, AT and T believes in climate change. Okay, so this is going to be about low emissions and renewables. Uh, the next element, AT and T keeping an eye on companies like Helium. All right, so this is interesting because this is. Uh, th this this involves like crypto, crypto mining, and then uh, having these small cell networks that people operate and use their own fiber as backhaul, and it creates like hotspots for users on the network. All right, so these I guess are viewed as IoT connections. Fifty three million connected cars on the AT and T network, so maybe they're looking at this as possibly affecting them. Uh, I don't see much elaboration on it. Um, I think we'll leave this article at that. There's a lot in here. You guys can check this out on your own comment on anything that I covered here. But I think for us, the important part, the 5G SA core is close. Cloud services is important to their business operations and that concierge service. <laughs> Be on the lookout for that. All right. Next story. AT&T CEO says companies ahead in satellite to cellular connectivity. All right. So this is big. We feel like <laughs> uh, ever since T-Mobile, quote unquote, announced satellite service with Starlink. Uh, there's been like this move to discuss this. This has been going on for years, folks. Things have been in motion to create this, especially on AT&T with their, I mean, this dates back to DirecTV acquisition years ago, right? So AT&T CEO John Stangy confirmed the operator is partnering with AST Space Mobile to provide connectivity in dead zones in the U.S. and said that AT&T is about 18 months ahead of its competitors, and that includes T-Mobile. Working with SpaceX on a similar satellite to cellular connectivity service to provide coverage in dead zones. Okay, so a lot of people were like, oh yeah, this is great, game-changing. Folks, carriers have been working on deals behind closed doors. They've been integrating business elements. They've been working on these things for a long time. Verizon has been doing this for over a year. AT&T has likely been doing this for almost two years. Here, finally, someone at AT&T speaks up about it. Stanky said that initially the SAT service will be for emergencies, including connectivity for FirstNet. That's huge, huge boost to FirstNet. Uh, we know how important the first responder network is, so they would get priority and they would be the focus at start. Uh, this is the first time we've heard any details about this type of uh, feature. Uh, the experimental license allowed AST Space Mobile to conduct Blue Walker 3 space to ground testing in the U.S. using 3GPP low band cellular frequencies. All right, now I will tell you guys this is a good situation. Low band makes more sense than a mid band uh, if we're talking about propagation here. Uh, and it's low band with needs, right? It's just probably calling and messaging. All right, so um, it says here that Stanky's declared it, it, they are comfortable with the test data. Next step is to present that data to the FCC, ask for approval, use spectrum licenses for satellite transmissions. All right, so T-Mobile's using PCS 1.9 gigahertz. Looks like um, AT&T wants to go with a low band frequency. They've got it, right? They got band 12, they got band 14. Uh, we'll see how this works out, but emergency operations via satellite sounds really good. We know that the iPhone 14 can do it. I think it goes back a previous generation or so. We know that the Android operating system can do it as well. Uh, Pixel devices and galaxies will likely be able to do it. So this is huge. This is pretty big. When it comes to emergency services, the first responder network, and uh, keeping those people connected. Eventually, it's definitely going to go to consumers, but that's probably where it's going to start. Comment down below on that. Last story, SpaceX to the FCC says... 
we shouldn't be required to show. <laughs> not required to show. It meets RDOF speed needs not yet. Or not yet, at least, I should say. Okay, so let's take a look at the story. SpaceX is continuing to counter claims about Starlink's broadband speed capabilities as the company pursues an appeal of the FCC's decision to deny its awards through the RDOF. Biosat, another SAT company, repeatedly lobbied to the FCC to reject Starlink's bids. So these two companies, at uh, they're, they're competitors, okay? So this is jacking for position, Viasat, the incumbent, and then Starlink, this new company, Bias had basically put the pressure here saying, hey, you know, they should be held to the same standards as us. If they don't do the same things that we do, they shouldn't qualify for funding. So SpaceX was denied the funding opportunity. Uh, they filed an appeal uh, or application for review, what's called an AFR. Uh, in September, after the FCC rejected the long form application for the RDOF award, Okay, so it says the company was initially approved for $885 million to cover over 640,000 locations in 35 states with LEO satellite broadband. Jessica Rosenworcel, the FCC chairwoman, said, We cannot afford to subsidize ventures that are not delivering the promised speeds or are not likely to meet program requirements. She's right, folks. She is correct. The thing about Starlink and SpaceX, if they can't meet the rigorous demands or even the baseline demands of what's expected in these dollars, right? In order to get this money, you got to be able to do X, Y, and Z. If they can't do it, why do they deserve the money? It doesn't make any sense. You should give it to the companies who meet those demands, who meet the criteria. That's just fair. That's as simple as that. Um, it says here that at, uh, I think this was a SpaceX senior director of satellite policy, he said the FCC's decision to reject Starlink's bids rests on unsupported conjecture and outside the record information, apparently cherry picked from somewhere on the internet. Oh, come on. <laughs> cherry picked data came from Oogla's Q1 speed test data, which showed Starlink is slowing down. Will easily meet the, applica uh, the applicable performance requirements in SpaceX winning bid areas by the RDOF milestone starting in 2025. You may be able to speculate that, Mr. Goldman, but there's no proof or evidence that you will do that. Meanwhile, if other companies can actually reach these milestones, you, sir, uh, have no legs to stand on. Okay. All right. So um, they got these, uh, these terms here on this data from Starlink's AFR. According to Viasat, they in indicate its intention to participate in the proceeding on SpaceX's AFR in a letter to the FCC. Shortly after the AFR was filed, speed test data for Starlink is only getting worse. Median download speeds are significantly lower than those that Starlink was providing even a few months ago. Guys, the data doesn't lie. This is true. We've looked at the data. Ookla is crowdsourced data. The speeds are dropping. Median speeds are dropping. Peak speeds are dropping. If they can't meet the requirements, they're not getting the money. Uh, if they can meet their... The task is tough. All right, I'm not saying that Starlink needs to be able to offer gigabit speed from satellite. But if the if the rule is this, if the standard is this, if the benchmark is this, and they can't reach it, they don't deserve the money and they shouldn't get it. It's as simple as that. Now, if they are able to meet it, and if they prove it by actually putting that speed on air, yeah, give them the money. Just saying. So starry Starlink, rules is rules and them's the facts, as they say. A uh, comment on this story. You are the voice of the people, the SMT Nation. Let your voice be heard. We got this one. We got the AT&T stories as well. Comment down below. Uh, like, share, subscribe for more, and turn on the bell notification icon to never miss an upload. Links in the description for my Twitter, my Gmail address for business inquiries, my Patreon page is there. Uh, we also have channel memberships now open. Join us, support us, get early access to content, exclusive vids, perks, benefits, just for supporting your favorite creators. Thanks for watching. See you on the next one. Peace.